question 13 from the 2016 HSC tuner exam. Part A. Consider the function y equals 4x cubed minus x to the power 4. Part I. Find the two stationary points and determine their nature. Okay, so here's our function and we need to find the stationary points and determine their nature. So to find stationary points, we look at the first derivative. So differentiating this function, that will give us 12x squared minus 4x cubed. And to find the stationary points, we set the first derivative dy on dx equal to 0. So when dy on dx is equal to 0, that's 12x squared minus 4x cubed equals 0. So factoring out of 4x squared gives me, here I'm left with 3, and here I'm left with x equal to 0. And so once I solve that, that's x equal to 0 and x equal to 3. So I know that I have stationary points at these two x values, and so therefore I need to work out the nature of these stationary points now. So to work out the nature of the stationary points, well, I could do two things. I could check either side on the first derivative, or I could go to the second derivative. And since this function is just a polynomial, it's not too complicated, it's a good idea to go to the second derivative instead of drawing up that table of the first derivative. So the second derivative would be differentiating this. d2y on dx squared is equal to 24x minus 12x squared. And it might be a good idea to factor out a 12x here. And that will give me 2 and x. Alright, so that's my second derivative. Now I need to plug in these x values to determine the nature. So when x is equal to 0, d2y on dx squared is equal to, well, plugging 0 into this, that's going to be 0 times 2, so that's 0. So I have the first derivative equal to 0, and I have the second derivative equal to 0. So that means I have a horizontal point of inflection at x equal to 0. So therefore, we have a horizontal point of inflection at x equal to 0. But we don't just want x equal to 0, we want the coordinate. So that means I also need a y value. So plugging x equal to 0 into the function, that will be 0 minus 0. So we're referring to the origin here. So I'll have a horizontal point of inflection at the origin. <clears throat> okay, now, that's the first uh, stationary point. Now, for the second stationary point, we do the same thing. We substitute into the second derivative, d2y on dx squared. And when we do that, we get 12 times 3, which will be 36, times 2 minus 3, which is negative 1. So I have negative 36, and I don't actually care what the value of the second derivative is, I only care about the sign. So I can see that this is less than zero. So that means when the second derivative is less than zero, I have a maximum turning point. Maximum turning point at three comma what? Well, that just comes from substituting three into this. And if I do that, I would actually get 27. I've worked that out before. Okay. So that's the first part. Now let's have a look at the second part. Sketch the graph of the function clearly showing the stationary points and the x and y intercepts. All right, so we've already worked out the stationary points. Now let's just work out x and y intercepts. So for part two, or double I, x and y intercepts. Well, the x intercepts, How do I get the x-intercepts, well, plural, x-intercepts? That is when I set y is equal to 0. So therefore, I'm solving 0 equal to 4x cubed minus x to the 4. I can factor out an x cubed, and I have 4 minus x here, left over, is equal to 0. So therefore, when x is equal to 0 or 4, so therefore, these are my x-intercepts. And my y-intercepts? Where do we get those? Well, that's when x is equal to 0. And plugging x equal to 0 here is very easy. That'll be 0 minus 0. So I'm at the origin. So y equals 0. 
So the origin is a y-intercept and also an x-intercept. Now, to put these two together, we can graph the function. All right, so I've drawn a neat axis here. And I need to use the information that I have in order to graph my function. So what information do I have? I have that it crosses the x-axis at 0, x equal to 0 and x equal to 4. So x equal to 4 would be here. And of course the origin is here, x equal to 0. And the y-intercept, well, also corresponds with the x-intercept at the origin. So that's fine. And then I also know from part i that I have two stationary points. I have a horizontal point of inflection at the origin and at the point 3 comma 27, so that would be perhaps somewhere up here, it doesn't particularly matter where I put the 27, I have a maximum turning point here. So I know that my function is something like this here, looks something like that there. It's going to reach a maximum point and then come back down. All right, now what else do I know? If I look at my function, what happens when x becomes very large? Well, when x becomes very large, that means, in other words, x approaches infinity. When x becomes very large, the x to the power 4 is going to dominate the x to the power 3 term, because the higher the power, the more effect that it will have on the function's value. So, it's going to be minus of something very large, so that means it's going to approach negative infinity. So for very large x values, I'm somewhere here, down here. I'm somewhere that's very, very large in the negative direction. And what about if I substitute in a very large negative number? Well, once again, when we go to infinity, positive or negative, the highest power is going to dominate. So I'm concerned really with just x to the power 4. Now when I substitute a negative large number in here, well this is an even power, so that's going to become positive. But I also have this minus out the front, so the entire thing is going to be a very large negative number. So that means for large values in the negative direction, I'm negative, I'm down here somewhere. So I didn't put in my horizontal point of inflection. That's going to look something like this. It's going to have a zero gradient at the origin, but it's not going to turn. It's going to go up, be zero, and then up again. So therefore I can just connect my dots or my bits of information. Now my diagram's probably not going to be the neatest, but that's not really the concern. The concern is that I have the general shape of, of this function. So here is my point 3, and so I have my turning point at 3, 27. Here is my intercept at 4. Here, of course, is the origin, and I'm going down to negative infinity both times. Okay, and that's the end of the question. Part B. Consider the parabola x squared minus 4x equals 12y plus 8. Part I. By completing the square or otherwise, find the focal length of the parabola. So here is my equation for the parabola, and the question says to complete the square. So I'll complete the square on x here. So to do that, I half the coefficient of x, so that'll be negative 2, and then I square it, and that'll be positive 4. So I add positive 4, but of course I can't just add positive 4 to one side without doing it to the other side. So I add positive 4 to both sides, which does nothing to the overall value of the function. But what it does do, it puts this in a nice form, namely in the form of a perfect square, which is why we call it completing the square. And here I can write 12y plus 12. And then I can also factor out 12 here. And now I'm in the standard form of a parabola which is facing upwards or downwards, so not sideways. So my standard form is this, and that's x minus h squared equals 4a into y minus k, where h comma k is the vertex of the parabola and a is the focal length. So 
The question did ask for the focal length, so I just have to work out what a is, and that's not too difficult. 4a is equal to 12, and so therefore a is 3. And therefore I can say the focal length is 3. Focal length is 3. Fine. Now, the next part is to find the coordinates of the focus. So, next part, finding the coordinates of the focus. Well, from my standard form, I can easily read off what the coordinates of the vertex are. The vertex has coordinates, well, h is 2, and k is negative 1. Pay attention here, because we have a negative here and a positive here, so that's why k is negative 1. And so therefore, my parabola looks something like this. I have this here. My vertex is at 2, comma, negative 1, so somewhere down here. And it just goes like this, something really rough here. So this is 2, comma, negative 1. Now, I want the coordinates of the focus. That's what the question's asked. And the focus will be a unit above the vertex. So somewhere maybe here. I know this is not well done to scale, but this is my focus here, S. And that distance in here is A units. And that's what we call the focal length. It's the distance from the vertex to the focus. So therefore, I can say that the focus is of this form. It's H, comma, K plus A. So all it is, is I'm just going up A units for my Y coordinate from the vertex which is 2, negative 1 plus 3, which is 2, comma 2. So those, well, this is the coordinates of the, vert of the focus. Right, and that completes part B. Part C. A radioactive isotope of curium has a half-life of 163 days. Initially, there are 10 milligrams of curium in a container. The mass M of T in milligrams of curium after t days is given by m of t equals a times e to the power negative kt where a and k are constants part i state the value of a now this question says to simply just state the value of a and it is worth one mark so they're only looking for a correct answer now in this form of a exponential decay the coefficient of the exponential is always going to be the initial value so here we're told that initially there are 10 milligrams of curium in a container, so we should know straight away that A is equal to 10 milligrams. But if you're a bit unsure of how we got to that, let's just write down this model, this function. M of T equals whoop, A e to the negative kT. Now at initial time, that's when T is equal to 0, I substitute M of, substitute T equal to 0, so M of 0 should be equal to a times e to the power negative k times 0. And we're told that initially the value is 10 milligrams. So here this is 10 milligrams, and I have a times e to the power 0, but e to the power 0 is 1, so I have a times 1, and so therefore a is equal to 10. Okay? But in general, when we have an exponential decay of this form, the coefficient a in this case it's a, but the coefficient of the exponential is always going to be the initial value of whatever substance we're dealing with. All right, and part two, given that there are 163 days, sorry, given that after 163 days, only five milligrams of curium remain, find the value of k. All right, so part two, I can rewrite my function now. Instead of a, I can write 10 because that's the value of a. So 10 e to the negative kt. Now it said that after 163 days, only 5 uh, milligrams remain. So that means when t is 163, then my m of t is going to be 5. So I can plug these now into this equation. So I have 5 equals 10 to the times e to the power negative k times 163. Now I'll just have to solve for k because that's what I'm looking for, finding the value of k. So divide everything by 10, so I get 5 divided by 10 will be a half, e to the negative 163k, 
and now my unknown is in the uh, exponent, so I have to use a logarithm. So the natural log of a half equals the natural log of e to the negative 163 times k. And then I can use my log laws. That's going to be bringing the power down, minus 163k times the log of the natural log of e. But the natural log is in base e, so log of base e, log of e in base e is going to be 1. So this is minus 163k is equal to log of a half. So therefore, k is equal to log of a half divided by 163k, well, it's divided by minus 163k, but I can put the negative at the top. And if I work this out, I should get 4.25 times 10 to the negative 3, but you might want to just check that for yourself. And that's the end of part C. Part D. The curve y equals root 2 times cos of pi on 4x meets the line y equals x at a point p, 1, 1, as shown in the diagram. Find the exact value of the shaded area. So this is the shaded area here. Now we need to find the exact area. Now this, this area that we're trying to find is bounded between two curves. So when we want to find the area between two curves, it's the integral of the top curve's function minus the bottom curve's function because that would give us everything below the curve here, and then we subtract off that extra bit that we have left over by taking off everything below the lower curve. So, in our case, the top curve is y equals root 2 cos of pi on 4x. That's right here. And our lower curve is y equals x. So, <clears throat> my area is going to be the integral. Now, what are my bounds? What are the bounds of my integral? I'm going from x equals 0 to x equal to 1. So if I just drop a parallel line here, parallel to the y-axis, that should be the point y equal, or x equals 1. So those are my bounds between 0 and 1. And my top curve was the square root of 2 cos pi on 4x, and the bottom curve was y equals x. And of course, I'm integrating with respect to x. So, now I just have to compute this. So, the integral of the square root of cos pi on 4x. Well, the square root of 2 is a constant. Now, integrating cos is positive sine. So, this becomes sine pi on 4x. But I have to divide by the inside derivative here. So, that means I divide by pi on 4 minus integrating x is x squared on 2. And I'm going between 0 and 1. So I substitute in the top limit first. That will give me the square root of 2. And having pi on 4 in the denominator is like multiplying by 4 on pi. So that I have 4 on pi. Subbing 1 in gives me sine of pi on 4. Subbing 1 into here, I get, well, just a half. And then subbing 0 into sine, sine of 0 is 0, and x or 0 squared will be 0 as well. So I have 4 root 2 on pi multiplied by sine pi on 4. Pi on 4 is 45, so sine 45 is root 2 on 2, or it's also 1 on root 2. They're the same thing, but I'm going to write it like this because I can have an easy cancellation here. Minus a half. And of course, this 0 is 0. We don't worry about that. So I'm left with 4 on pi minus a half units squared for my aerial. And that's the end of part D and the end of question 13.